All right, hello. My name is Dr. Michael Edwards. Um, I am the founder and owner of my own uh, bioinformatics consulting firm, BioInfo Solutions. Trust me, I'll plug it at the end as well. <laughs> uh, I also have a wide variety of uh, social media, YouTube videos that you can go and check out if, if you uh, find this talk interesting. Um, I was, I used to be an assistant professor here. Um, I got tired of driving into work every day. <laughs> the great thing about bioinformatics is you can work from home and I can work on million dollar cancer studies, you know, on my laptop, on my couch, in my shorts. So it's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, today, what I wanted to do, I, I've been giving this talk for a while and usually what I do is I give you kind of an introductory bioinformatics lesson. And that was really relevant about two years ago, but I think most people are kind of understand bioinformatics. Uh, anybody, everybody here hear of bioinformatics? Anybody not heard of bioinformatics? Okay, that's good. <laughs> so today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a little more technical. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about pathways. And from what I understand, you guys have been working in a lab about five weeks now. Um, have they been throwing pathways at you already? No? What, uh, what are some of the pathways that you're familiar with that you've been working on in lab? Beta catenine. Beta catenine. Okay, yep, that's one. How about you? Map kinase. Map kinase, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, who else? Yeah. The PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. <laughs> right. But all these pathways, you notice you're giving me genes, right? Is the whole gene, is the whole pathway a gene? No. And these pathways that you are given, do you even know who created those? Right? Can you, you can probably look it up, right? But does anybody do that? Is it just one group? Is it a lot of groups? What tissue was it uh, developed in? I have a kind of a thing about pathways. I kind of loathe them. <laughs> these are these artificial kind of constructs that we build. And I'm going to kind of show you an example here. So has anybody heard of KEG, Kyoto uh, Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes? This is where most of these text miners, this is where they get the pathways, right? This right here is the map kinase pathway for humans. So here are all the genes in here. And it, as you can look at it, you know, stimuli comes on the outside. This is a stress response pathway. Stimuli comes on the outside of the cell, uh, starts this signaling cascade, which ends up in cellular, uh, some kind of cellular function, right? This looks very, I mean, it looks very simple, right? Very straightforward, almost looks like a, you know, electric circuit board. This is not how it goes. <laughs> These are the references for that map kinase pathway. Can you all see that there? Can you see the dates on some of those? Can you read that at all? 2002. 2001. Uh, right. That's a while ago. How old are these references for this pathway that that people continually reference? What's what's the old what's the what's the oldest or the newest reference there? Do they may see? 2003. 2003. Right. That's 14 years ago. <laughs> I think we've done some uh, work since then, right? Do you want to see the references for the map map or the mouse map kinase signaling pathway? There. <laughs> That's it. Right, human mass, same pathway, same references. This isn't how biology works. This is a group, and this is more how biology works. They took some cardiac and pulmonary cells and basically stimulated them with all kinds of stimuli here, hypoxia, hyperoxia, all this stuff. And they basically measured gene expression, and they colored it based on the stimulus that this gene actually uh, did, was differentially expressed. And this is kind of how signaling goes. It's not an electric circuit board, it's a cloud. <laughs> and it's a cloud that we don't, that is very unique to whatever you're studying. That the map kinase signaling pathway, and that was another thing I was gonna talk about on those references, is most of those references are neuronal cells, right? What if you're look, working on epithelial cells, right? Maybe not so relevant. So again, this is kind of what I'm trying to going to talk about today is how do we get to the real cell signaling mechanism in these and whatever you're looking at. And this is another problem too. 
so these are, this was a study I did looking at aggressive lymphoma. These are some of the pathways that were overrepresented in the genes that change in aggressive lymphoma. If there's a line between the pathways, that means they share genes, and that's the number of genes they share. Look at this rat's nest over here. And these are only like the 25 top uh, uh, overrepresented pathways. You can see this T helper cell differentiation shares seven genes with this OX40 signaling pathway, right? Which, which pathway do I take? Are they really the same pathway? Are all these really the same pathway? We're just artificially dividing them up. So again, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you how do we get, how do you figure out without relying on what some, a few experts did maybe 15 years ago, how do you generate your own pathways and see these interactions in whatever system you're examining? So how do we know what's connected? And that is a huge thing in biology. And I'm going to tell you right now, and I, it always kills me, <laughs> is that labs, you know, we like to think in just small terms. And so, you know, this lab works on this gene, this lab works on just this gene, but it doesn't really work that way. Nothing works in your cell by itself. One gene influences another gene, which impacts this gene, which, which inhibits this gene, which stimulates the whole thing again, right? So how do we get to what's connected? And what I'm going to show you today, it's simple math. It's incredibly simple math that you can use to get to these true signaling pathways. So we're going to talk about Sir Francis Galton. I always ask this question. I know it's probably no one's heard. There's going to probably be one person. Anybody heard of Sir Francis Galton? One person, yes. Don't remember. <laughs> yeah, that's usually what happens. I go, hey, Mary Francis Scott, and some of you raise your somebody raise their hand, like, what do you do? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> well, he was a famous guy uh, back in the day. Uh, he was the cousin of Charles Darwin. In fact, I think he was smarter than his cousin. Uh, he was greatly influenced by Charles Darwin's work in evolution biology and kind of applied that stuff to, to some of his own studies in hereditary, uh, heredity. Uh, just like all the cool scientists of his day, he was a jack of all trades. He was a tropical explorer, geographer, meteorologist, psychologist, and criminologist. Um, I guess I could tell this class. <laughs> On one of his trips, he would go to the Middle East, and I read some of his biographies. And in one, there was a one of the this guy that was basically hosting him in, in the Middle East writes him a letter and says, "Hey, I'm sorry about your you know your last trip." Next time you're down here, you know, we'll get you a virgin. <laughs> so based on biography, he probably got an STG over in the Middle East. After that, like his love life, he didn't really talk about like he had a wife forever, but everybody described it as a loveless marriage. And, yeah, they didn't have penicillin back then. So. <laughs> uh, the probably reason you didn't hear about him is, is because he's known as the father of eugenics. Anybody here are eugenics? Yeah, that's crap. <laughs> What's funny is, you know, it's the belief that you there's some inherent variable inside people, and a lot of people have used race for this, that will make you better than somebody else. And they used to measure the shape of your head, all that good stuff. Um, it's funny, though, and we use, I use his techniques a lot. The, he developed the wisdom of crowd. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Maybe I can't tell that story. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Um, you know, that kind of just proves it, that the, the best in all of us isn't probably the outliers, it's the average of everybody. And he, he did a lot of work in that area. Um, he was a geneticist, he pioneered the biometric approach. So this is the belief that if you measure enough about something, you can figure it out, right? And if you compare whatever you measure of one thing to something else, say like a disease versus not disease, you can figure a lot about that system, right? And then we use this in bioinformatics all the time. And I'm going to go over some of the data that we use or that I use to analyze. And the way he, he influenced me the most is a statistician. And that's probably what you meant to say when you said, yeah, I know him. He's a statistician. <laughs> he, uh, he developed the, the concepts of variance and standard deviation, which are huge concepts in uh, statistics. Uh, he also developed the concept of correlation or the regression to the mean, linear correlation. We use this all the time, and I'm going to talk about this a lot. And this is how we use, we use this simple math to get to these, these uh, cellular signaling networks. 
And again, I mentioned the wisdom of crowd. It had to do with a bull. Look it up. It's, it's a cool story. Uh, some of the people, and he's influenced a lot of people in science. I mean, there was a lot of good ideas that came out of this cranky STD reel with the old hat right here. <laughs> One of his students was Carl Pearson. Anybody may hear a Carl Pearson, Pearson correlation test, maybe. Very common correlation test. Um, he loved his mentor so much, he wrote a three volume biography on his mentor that I did not read because I guess I'm interested in all the goofy STD stuff. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, Pearson influenced Spearman. This is a Spearman correlation test. This is the non-parametric version of the, the Pearson test. It's kind of a rank sum test. Uh, also, this guy, William Gossett. Anybody hear of him? He developed the most famous statistical test in all of mathematics. And he was Pearson's pupil. And he guesses what that test might be, statistical test. You use it all the time. T-test, yes. Do they name it the Gossett test? No. They name it the student's T-test. So actually, he was working for Guinness at the time. I can't tell the story. I'll tell the story. Okay. <laughs> so he was working at Guinness at the time, and he basically figured out a way. What they wanted to do was test whether the beer was affected by how far they shipped it. And so there's all kinds of things you can measure. I think actually he measured uh, aspects of the barley but basically, he developed this test, the T-test, to determine whether something was truly different. And since he was working for the brewery, he couldn't publish under his known name, so he had to publish under student. So the world's, famous, world's most famous statistical test is he, he goes anonymous on that. What about one more guy? What about Nate Silver? Has anybody heard of Nate Silver? 538. 538, yes, thank you very much. See, I know I'm, now I'm starting to get into the <laughs> so you recognize what did he do? He correctly predicted the past three U.S. elections, but not this past one. Yeah, yeah, there were some so issues with sampling. Totally. Well, in 2012, he actually predicted, I think it was every one except maybe there was an election in North Dakota he didn't yeah, predict. Yeah. Right? NC3. And the thing he, the, the reason why he did that, why he was so accurate, is he didn't give any polls himself. What he did, and we're going to talk about this today, we can do this in science, right? He just got all the polls that were out there, some were bad, some were really good. He found the middle of all those polls and was able to predict the, the entire election. We do this, I do this with science, and we're going to talk about how we can do that today. But the big thing I'm going to talk about is correlations, because correlations are huge in science. And this is how we know about why, you know, Man-made CO2 is contributing to global warming, right? We can look, based on ice cores, we can sample almost a million meters back the atmospheric CO2. So we can use correlation. So again, you know, look at these two curves here. Again, this is two variables over a lot of time. What do these curves look like? They look the same, don't they? Right? They're correlated. Based on this, based on this similar pattern, we would expect that these two are somehow connected, right? And that given the fact that we are measuring the CO2 concentrations higher than any point in the past million years, we expect the temperature to follow suit, right? That's the whole thing behind, you know, basically climate change. Again, we can do this in biology. We do it in lung tumors, and I've done this, right? That we can basically we are very familiar with how lung tumors develop. And that we can take a bronchioscope and somebody who's at risk, we can see a, basically a section that doesn't look right in their lungs, take that section out or take a piece out of that, that tissue out, basically put it on slides and then look at its morphology. Based on its morphology and based on doing this lots and lots of times, we basically developed a, you know, how these tumors, these lung tumors developed. And they could go from normal, this would be what a, a normal tissue looks like, all the way up to cancer. The thing is, is we don't treat lung tumors until they get to seven, until they get really nasty, because most of these tissues actually regress. So you don't want to give somebody chemotherapy if they're not going to need it, right? It's horrible. The treatment for cancers is horrible. So can we develop, basically do the same thing, can we develop a metric that will actually increase or decrease as the cancer gets worse? 
Not only that, but can we also determine whether there's a difference between, say, a lesion that will regress or one that will get progressively worse? And I did that, right? You can do this with genes, right? Gene expression. That given here is this LYPD3, and you can see as the tumor gets worse, the expression tends to increase, but it really increases in the persistent. And we can see these two different things. Oh, thank you. But gene expression isn't the only thing we can correlate on. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell, talk to you about what are some of the other things that we can use, some of the, the biological measurements we can use about any the particular tissue or an organism. And there's a ton. Everybody familiar with the central dogma of biology? We used to like bow to this like 20 years ago. <laughs> it still holds. I mean, it's still pretty relevant. But there's a ton of other stuff that, you know, we could look at. So basically, you know, central dogma, you've got your nucleotides. You've got 6.4 billion nucleotides in your human DNA. This has approximately 25,000 genes in it. If your DNA wants to do anything, it has to make a copy of itself, makes mRNA. This mRNA gets translated by the proteins into proteins. And there is about, in its purest native state, maybe about 400 or 500,000 different proteins. Just this information alone, again, we can measure all of this. Just this information alone is pretty overwhelming, but there's more, right? Now we also have microRNAs. Anybody working on microRNAs in here? No? There are these short little 25 mers that will bind to the mRNA and cause its degradation. Again, it's another level of, of control we have on this whole process. And people are very interested in microarrays because they, they tend to be hairpins and they will survive in your bloodstream. So a lot of people are trying to use these as potential markers. So there's about 900 of those. Let's go to the <coughs> RNA. So there's not just 25,000 different kinds of RNA based, you know, as many genes that a particular mRNA can, you know, it has introns in it, exons, it can be shuffled, it can be moved around. I used to work on a gene that had 11 different copies of its mRNA, and they all did something different. And it used to drive me crazy. I'm so glad I don't work on it anymore. <laughs> but again, another level of complexity that we have, and we can measure all this, right? We can, we can not only measure mRNA, but we can determine what isoform that is. Let's go to the proteins. I used to do proteomics and I got out because <laughs> proteomics is tough. You could take a protein and you just chemically modify it. You put a phosphate on it, you ubiquitate it, glycosylation, it all changes the function. And again, it all does something different. And again, we can measure all this. Let's go back to the, uh, the nucleotides. So I would say probably the biggest control over transcription isn't like transcription factors or promoters, it's the actual structure of the DNA itself. Then if I took the DNA from one of my cells and I stretched it lengthwise, it would be as tall as I am, right? I could take all the DNA in my body and it would stretch to Pluto and back. In order for your DNA to fit in your cells, it has to be compacted very, very well, right? And this is what your DNA does. So it'll basically wrap around these histones, these little beads in your DNA, these beads can be methylated, they can be acetylated. And again, we can measure all this. Now, why is this important? Can everybody see that, those two bugs down there? Sort of. <laughs> Trust me, those pixels look like grasshoppers. Well, actually, one of them is a locust, the other is a grasshopper. The locust, reddish in color, shorter than a normal grasshopper, more aggressive, likes to fly a lot, it swarms, it gets with its buddies and will travel hundreds and thousands of miles and eat all the community's crops and, and basically devastate a community. Grasshopper, on the other hand, a lot longer, pretty mellow, green, um, pre, again, pretty local. The difference between these two, there is no genetic difference whatsoever. The only difference is how they pack their DNA, right? So this is huge, right? You can basically, Kind of a Jekyll and Hyde without even changing your DNA. Again, we can measure all this. These are all things that we can use for correlations. But my bread and butter in bioinformatics is usually gene expression. And I like gene expression because it's kind of like if, if you just do the sequence, it's, it 
it's kind of seeing what somebody looks like, but if you measure the gene expression, it's how they act, right? And I'm more concerned with how somebody acts than what they look like. So I really like gene expression. And again, you know, DNA produces the genes in your DNA, produces mRNA that translates into proteins. It's like headquarters here sending emails to the factories to, to basically give orders to, to make certain products, right? Does the workers always obey the boss? No, <laughs> I'm glad people, last class I did, no one said, everybody went like this. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> um, so, no, they don't, but for the most part they do. You know, you're, you're mostly gonna do whatever your boss says, you know, if you get an email. And that's kind of what we do is we hack the cell. We basically hack the emails of the cell and then we use that to basically see its levels. And we, a lot of what I used to do, and I still do this a lot, are these things called gene chips. Anybody see gene chips before? Yeah? These ha this has changed scientific research. That on each one of these chips, I can measure the gene expression of every gene in your body. And that's huge. Pass it around. Yeah, they make good paperweights too. Good weapons. <laughs> so what we do with these gene chips is, like I said, we'll isolate all the messenger RNA or total RNA. We'll basically make lots of copies of it, and as we make copies, we add this fluorescent unit to it. Once once that fluorescent unit is added, we put it to these chips. There's the, you can see these holes in the back of those chips, and we'll basically inject that in and we will hybridize that for about 16 hours. It will bind to its complement on that chip. And again, there is a complement to every gene in your genome, in those chips. We wash off anything that doesn't bind and then we scan it with a very expensive laser. I think they're like a half a million dollars. Basically, what we'll do is we will add, get fluorescence. That if, say I went on a drinking binge last night and I measured my mRNA today, my alcohol dehydrogenase would be much higher than somebody else probably, right? Based on that, there would be more fluorescence, I would see more message, it would be a, a wider color, and we would give it a higher number. Again, if somebody, say I was hanging out with a Mormon that night, and he wasn't drinking, <laughs> his, his levels would be much lower, and there would be a much darker color in the Again, you can see how we can use these chips, take a bunch of people with a disease, people that are healthy. What's different? What are the genes that are different between these two conditions? Again, straight up mathematics. So we did that. And so I use this, I use the gene chips, I use transcription to figure out what what certain genes are doing. And a collaborator came to me, and his name was Robert Wynn. He's now at the University of uh, Chicago. But he had a very, he worked on lung cancer, and he had a very specific, particular gene, junction placoglobin. Anybody hear of this gene before? Yeah, no one does. <laughs> All right, it's also known as gamma, gamma catenin. But anyway, he noticed that in these advanced lung cancers that he was looking at, this protein in most of them disappears in metastatic tumors. Right? And he doesn't know why. That this protein seems to hang out on these cell membranes and basically, especially these desmosomes, and these are kind of the attachments to the neighbors of epithelial cells. You can see that if you lose something in this protein, maybe you lose this desmosome, then that cancer cell can go on and spread. He's like, we know this gene is important. This happens to me all the time. Mike, we know this gene is important. We measure it, it goes away in this condition, but we have no idea what it does and how it does whatever it does. So he's like, can you help me? He's like, I have no data. <laughs> and I'm like, no problem. There's lots of data out there, Rob, no problem. So that's what I did, is what I wanted to do was, I wanted to figure out what this gene does, especially in relationship to lung cancer. So to do this, I'm just gonna do the whole I'm just going to use a Pearson correlation. That if you look at these genes up here, right? So each one of these bars rep represents a different sample in this data set. The height of that bar is indicative of the gene, ex gene expression in that sample. 
So the higher the bar, the higher the gene expression. The lower the bar, the lower expression. What do you notice about these two things? These are two different genes. Look alike? A little bit? Totally. Yeah, positive correlation. What do you think about that? What are the, why might they, based on all these different samples, why would they have the same pattern? What do you think is going on? Anybody know? Hold on, I'll tell you. <laughs> You know, maybe they're working together, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, that things that act, you know, if somebody's in the same place as somebody else all the time, they're probably friends, right? Yeah, I always get a weird reaction to this, especially the older crowds really go nuts. But, like, the younger crowd is like, what is up with that, like, <laughs> who are these two twins here? What's up with this blue monkey? By the way, look at Aquaman. Has anybody seen like the new trailers for the Aquaman? He looks like the lead singer for like a death metal band. This is what Aquaman looked like back in the day. <laughs> I wouldn't let him anywhere near my kids. <laughs> okay, we made fun of that. Okay, but now here's another example, right? So we have two genes again, right? This is the same gene up here. Now look at the pattern. When this one's high, this one's low. When this one's low, this one tends to be high. And I think this is really cool here is you can see in these samples, it just goes up. One, two, three goes up, and here, one, two, three goes down in those same samples. So what do you think is going on there? What is this gene doing? What do you think is the relationship between these two genes? What? Yeah, maybe. Antagonistic, right? Right? Maybe the Legion of Doom. Maybe they're enemies. Right? But all of these things are important. That if I can find a gene's best friends and worst enemies, I can know a lot about them. Right? Or about this gene. And so this is exactly what I do. So what I do is I do this on two very large lung cancer cell line data sets. One of these is from UT Southwestern uh, Medical Center in Dallas. Um, they have set, they they did a gene expression on 76 lung cancer cells of all different types of cancers. They use AFI to probe these, so basically they're probing 45,000 different probe sets. I also use another data set. This is the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. Anybody heard of that? You should check this out. Like, they have so much stuff. And it's free. <laughs> Let me say that again. It's free. <laughs> but they have 166 lung cancer cell lines. Again, they use the same technology. It's a different chip, but some of the but most of these probe sets are the same. This has a, a little bit more. So what we can do now is what I can do is I can correlate. I can basically take a gene of interest like Jupe, and I say where are my best friends and worst enemies in this data set and in this data set. If you actually look at the data sets, they only share about sixty percent of the smaller data sets cell lines. So there's commonality and there's also differences. Uh, also here, this is showing 72, about four of these cancer cell lines I couldn't use in my, my uh, analysis. They just, something was wrong with them. So this is what I'm going to do is I am going to basically find my gene of interest and I'm going to look in these two data sets. And again, it's free. I did this for free. So in order for me to find good correlations, you know, I need a kind of a good spread of uh, in the expression of this gene. And basically here is this is a log two score here for, for its gene expression. And here's what that gene is doing in all these different samples. You can see there's a pretty good spread here. So I'm pretty hopeful that I'm going to find a lot of genes that are similar and very different. When I do the correlations, I just use a simple Pearson correlation. This isn't a fancy algorithm, basic math from the 1900s. I'm basically taking, I'm finding all those genes with a absolute R value of greater than 0.5. When I do that, I end up with 324 that are correlated in the bigger data set and 252 in the smaller. But from those two, I now have 152 genes in common. That's my little wrinkle with this whole thing is that, and I, I need to explain this, is correlations are extremely powerful, but they generate lots and lots of positive or false positives. So my wrinkle is, the great thing about false positive, it should be random. 
that the same false positive I get in this data set should not be in this data set here. So by taking only those common, I'm really kind of drilling into what the heck that gene does. And I'm really like, these are the genes that really matter. So what I'm going to talk about are these 152 genes about jupe, how I use to, to basically define what jupe is. And again, this is only 0.6% of all the human genes in the human genome. So a very small subset. So when I do the correlations, you know, I, I generate lists in both groups. These are my common genes, but or these are just all the genes that were, were uh, correlated. But here's what's interesting, and this is what I, I find interesting, is that not only am I getting the same direction of change or the same correlation, if it's negative, it's also negative over here, but I'm also, it's also kind of ranked similarly. That this spit one, as you can see, was the highest correlated gene in both data sets, and we're gonna talk about that. That's what my correlator want, by collaborator wants, is he wants something to manipulate the system. Can you give me something, Mike, that I can use to modulate jupe, or maybe basically reproduce, you know, the effects of jupe without having jupe there? And again, but you can see here that, you know, we're sharing, you know, not only we get correlating the same genes, but they're also correlating in the same kind of magnitude, which gave me a lot of hope that what we are seeing here isn't, isn't imaginary, it isn't voodoo, this is real. This is a real gene expression network. So I'm just going to briefly explain how we determine, because I'm going to talk about pathways now. I know I poo-pooed on pathways, <laughs> but we have to talk about them because everybody loves them. So I'm going to tell you how people identify pathways overrepresented in, in gene lists. And it's, this is basically the core of bioinformatics in its simplest terms. So if I have a pathway here, and say this pathway, we know that it's important in lung cancer. There's 40 members of this pathway. And I have those 152 genes that I found correlated to you. The great thing about bioinformatics and about what I do, or what we do, is that there's a limited number of genes. And that's what makes the statistics all work. Is that picture these 40 members as pink balls in a sea of 25,000 green balls, right? If I draw 152 times out of these 25,000 genes with these 40 pink balls in it, what are the odds that I get one of those? What do you think? They're pretty, yeah, that's, that's not unusual, right? But what if I draw 152 times and now I get three pink balls? That's, that's not so usual now. That would be unusual. <laughs> but now, this is what happens though. I have 152 draws, now I get seven balls. The probability of that happening by random chance is not random anymore, really. <laughs> what this is telling me is that this pathway is probably playing a role in my system. Even though I can't get all of these, I'm getting enough of them in my gene list that that would, for me, signify that this group is somehow involved in this. And we can do this with any biological group we want. We make these groups ourselves. So that's how bioinformatics works, is what are the odds that I get all these things connected to a particular biological thing by random chance? And so when I did that, I basically did a pathway analysis for the genes, the 152 genes correlated to Uh Here are some of the most significant. And what again, if my collaborator believes that these genes are important in lung cancer, we should find things, metastatic lung cancer, we should find biological things, pathways associated with that. And sure enough, if you look here, there's a lot of cancer stuff that are coming up significant, right? Here are the number of genes that we found in our gene list. But look at this, invasion of tumor cell lines, you know, coming up. Again, this is flavoring my list. This is telling me I'm on the right track. Also, some of the software I use, I use uh, this software called Ingenuity Pathway Analysis. Anybody familiar with that? You probably will get <laughs> familiar with it. But anyway, it's a really cool program, and what it does is based on its database and the direction of the change that you're measuring in your system, it'll tell you whether that pathway is more up or down, or activated or inhibited. So as you can see, one of our most inhibited pathways is this metastasis of tumor cells. So when these genes that are associated with juke go up, this process goes down, which is kind of validating what my, uh, my collaborator told me. Then we look at the most activated Adhesion of tumor cells, right? 
When this thing goes up, when juke goes up, these cells start sticking together more. They don't spread. This cancer is not as bad. And then we can bring some of these pathways up. So if you see, if the gene is colored here, that means I found it in my 152 genes. This is Sertoli cell junction signaling. And again, you can see all these genes or these proteins are kind of on the outside, right? Cell connection. Again, this is giving kinetics to what the heck JUP is doing. Anybody know what a Sertoli cell is? Sperm. Sperm, yeah. <laughs> and that's another problem with, with pathways. I'll give somebody a Sertoli cell, I go, Hey, it's Sertoli cell junction signaling is like on fire. And they'll look at me like, I don't work on sperm. <laughs> I'm like, it's okay. It's just cell adhesion, right? We just give these pathways names, right? In whatever we find them in, but they do a heck of a lot of other stuff. And again, obviously tight junction signaling you can see here. Again, here are the R values are given underneath all of these. Again, this makes sense. You know, I am constructing, I basically took a system. I didn't know anything about it found free data, and now I'm basically at this pathway. We're showing these correlations. They're associated with cell adhesion, which basically my collaborator is telling me is important to the system. The true power of doing this kind of stuff is not finding what some expert found 15 years ago. It's making your own networks. And so this, path, this, this program, what it will do is it'll group these genes based on any relationship found in the literature, regardless if they're the same pathway or not. So this is the top network that was generated from this, from our gene list. The odds of getting these, so if, if there's a relationship, a direct relationship known in the literature, there, it's a solid line. If it's an indirect relationship, it's a dashed line. The odds of getting all of these associations by random chance is one times 10 to the negative 70th. Yeah. That's the same odds of, you know, Prince and Bowie coming back for a reunion concert next year. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> I'm waiting to do that. By the way, I love both of them. I'm not making fun of them, I swear. But again, and here's that spent one, right? Right here. Now we're seeing it's interacting with some things also on our list. So I showed this, you know, I showed this network to my collaborator. I'm like, look at all this cool stuff. And he's like, hey, we can only, we only have this much money, Mike. <laughs> we can only investigate one thing. So I'm like, well, let's go get after spent one. Right? Oh, and you can overlay different pathways on this. Again, if we look at what these genes do, it all makes sense with lung cancer, EMT transition, neoplasia cells, you know, epithelial cancer. This makes sense. And again, this is where you want to be. Why do I want to be where somebody else has been? I want to go where somebody else has not been. This is where I want to be. And if you do research, that's... I would imagine that's where you want to be. Who wants to confirm what other people already know? Okay, so spent one a little thing. It's a protease inhibitor. Uh, it, again, it inhibits these two genes that are also correlated to our genes. Uh, again, it was a top correlated uh, gene to JUP in both data sets. Uh, it's a hepatocyte growth factor activator inhibitor. So growth factor inhibitor. <laughs> Yay, yeah, it works for science, right? So you can see this might be a potential anti-cancer gene. Um, and again, this happens to me a lot as somebody will work, I'll be working on lung cancer and I find a gene and it has all kinds of different functions known in a different kind of cancer. Odds are it's probably doing the same thing in our cancer. So it is known to suppress metastatic, metastatic pulmonary colonization and pancreatic carcinoma cells. Also, and this is important, Nowhere in the literature has anybody identified spit one working with Jupiter. Okay? Except us. So he investigated, right? And this is what, how we investigate these things, is that if, if these things are connected, just like the, you know, the climate change data, right? If CO2 goes up, you know, temperature should go up. If jump goes up, spent one should go up. If spent one goes down, jump should go down. And basically what he did is he took a bunch of lung cancer cells, and looked at the presence of jupe and spent and noticed that when you don't have jupe, you have very little spent, and especially in this one. No jupe, no spent. Okay, well, what, what happens in the opposite, right? What happens if we over overexpress jupe? So here we have this cell line, 
H157. They overexpressed jupe and now a spin one goes up. Again, it's validating the network that I just created. This one's a little different, and this is the wrinkle that we found, is that this has a functional copy of P53. This one does not. When he overexpresses jupe, basically nothing happens to spin. But now when he inserts the wild type P53 back in, now we get a ton of spin. Again, P53 is a very well-known tumor suppressor. My spent one is now acting with, you know, the rock stars of tumor suppressors, <laughs> which is, again, association, right? If he's working with a cop, he's probably part of a cop, too. So, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and this always happens, too. So as we're working on this, we found this P53 connection, and this other group at the time says, hey, we know junction placoglobin interacts with P53 to regulate the expression of this 1433 sigma, which also was correlated to jupe, which is awesome. But anyway, you know, so basically we have validation that we know jupe interacts with P53 to affect the, the transcription of other genes. It's probably doing that same thing with spit one And again, what effect will this have on the phenotype of the cell? And if we overexpress spent, we see that calling numbers, the proliferation in both cells go down, even though we don't have jupe. Right? Also, migration, you know, we we're talking about jupe. We know it's involved in cell adhesion. How does it affect the, these tumor cells' migration? So what they'll do is they'll grow a bunch of cells on a plate and then basically scrape kind of a lane out from those cells and basically time how quickly it takes for those cells, the, the two fronts of the cells, to come back together, to grow back together. So here we have just the regular H157, and here we added the same cell line, but we also added spin in there. At 12 hours without spin, the cells have grown back, but after 24 hours, they still haven't even grown back. Again, validating our model, right? Metastatic tumors. Spit one is supposedly important that it's probably accelerating cell adhesion, so these, these tumors can't migrate and go off somewhere and get really bad. But now it has a mechanism, right? That jupe or gamma catenin induces P53, which induces this spit one which is also known as HAA1, which probably inhibits this growth factor, which is promoting cell proliferation, migration, uh, migration and invasion. Again, we didn't know this. I got all of this information for free. Well, not the, you know, the validating, but it's very odd, you know, it always kills me, and this happens to me a lot, is I'll have a cancer researcher come to me and say, I want to do this study, I'm working on this cancer, I've got 10 subjects, let's write a grant. And I say, well, has anybody done that cancer before? <laughs> and they'll say, I don't know. So I'll look in the database, and sure enough, I'll find another study that's actually like three times bigger than theirs, better controlled. You know, why would you ever want to like, you know, basically there's so much information out there. If you go out and find these networks, these true signaling networks, and you investigate all these different databases, you know, you get a head start. You can eliminate years at the bench. Uh, what's my, how am I doing on time? Okay. I'll come through this, <laughs> go through this faster. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk about one more. One more uh, way we actually did this, generating our own uh, gene uh, cell signaling uh, networks. Uh, I worked with a group. Her name was Christine Bowinkle. I think I said that right, finally. <laughs> if not, I'll just change it on the recording, so it's all good. <laughs> she works on acute lung injury. And acute lung injury, I, I was in pulmonary, so a lot of the stuff I talk about is, is pulmonary related. Um, but acute lung injury, so pulmonary is also known as critical care. And that, you know, you have to take care of a person's ability to breathe before you take care of anything else. So it's, that's very critical, and you don't really have time for those, you know, the ear sacs to, to repair. So acute lung injury, you get any type of injury, what happens in these uh, alve uh, <coughs> alveolus is that, I finally said that correctly too, is you get damage and all these different things happen, but this thing fills up with this protein-rich edema fluid, and you can't basically exchange oxygen anymore. What they believe is, and in order for that person to basically live or to get better, they have to get rid of this protein-rich edema fluid. 
she found a gene that she, she knew she would basically, they would, uh, through some uh, preliminary studies, her and some other groups believe that this gene is important in that clearance. Glycogen synthase kinase, 3 beta. It's involved in a lot of different things, uh, neuronal cell development, body pattern formation. Uh, mutations in this gene can cause a whole host of genes. So it's kind of pointing to the fact that this is kind of a central molecule. Um, but what they found is it's, it's detrimental to a, uh, during distress uh, via inhibition of the, these air sacs to um, do protein transport. What they wanted, what she wanted to know is, again, hey, Mike, I know this gene's important. We have no idea how it's doing what it's doing. Can you give it me some background? Of course I can. No problem. So again, I do the same thing. I find these two different, I use the same data sets. See if, what the expression of that gene is in the larger data set. And again, there's quite a wide variety of expressions, so I expect to get good patterns. And in fact, I did, I actually had to go up a little bit on the uh, correlation factor, so a little more significant. So here, I've taken any genes that are correlated to this gene, positively or negatively, at an absolute value of 0.55. When I do that, I end up with 120 genes that are in common. Here are the top 15 genes correlated to GSK in both data sets. Again, you can see they're kind of the, the same magnitude, that a highly correlated gene in one data set usually will be highly correlated in the other as well. And there's just so much cool stuff here. <laughs> you know, you can just pick up, pick apart all this stuff. You just go, you know, from from top to bottom. There's this dead protein that's all about apoptosis, you know, maybe we can inhibit that. You've got this PIK3C3 gene, you know, lots of signaling, that might be. But what I'm gonna tell you about, and then you've got uh, this MOB1A, so it was negatively correlated, so I found its arch enemy, which I think is cool. <laughs> I'll call that Lex Luthor there. But what I wanna talk about, again, Mike, we only have this much money, we can only investigate this much stuff. So. We decided to uh, basically spend most of our time with ELAB like one. There's SMAD4 down there. And that's another one. This is the top network that was produced from there, from these 120 genes. The odds of that happening, 1 times 10 to the negative 68th. Um, as you look at this network, though, what do you notice? Like, if you, were, if you wanted to modulate this network somehow, where are you going to go? What do you think? Common sense. Don't you don't even have to know anything about the genes, right? Just look at it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Look at this guy. So I do this whole other lecture where I talk about like genes are like mafia guys. And this is the godfather right here, man. <laughs> look at all the things it's impacting, right? Why would I ever want to investigate this gene when this one affects this gene and affects all these other genes as well? You can also see number one, number two, you also see candy one. This is another one I really want to go after, but they're like, we don't have the money. <laughs> but there's also, so the only evidence that ELAB like one interacts with GSK3B, there was one study where they did protein binding. That's all that's known about this relationship. But at least there is a relationship, right? That's telling me, let's go with ELAB like one. And sure enough, they did. Uh, it's, it's an RNA binding protein, it binds these. Uh, AU uh, rich elements in mRNA, so it affects lots and lots of genes. So it's a great candidate. I'm not going to talk about that one. Again, if they're connected, they sh you know, if this correlation is true, they should somehow be connected. So if we inhibit, if we add, if we silence the messenger RNA, we get a reduction in the mRNA of this GSK3B, not only at the mRNA, but the protein level as well. The reverse, what if we stabilize ELAB like one um, uh, messenger RNA uh, expression? Uh, they use this chemical to do this. As when we do that, again, the GSK3B goes up. More message, ELAB like one, more GSKB3B. Right? Again, that relationship really wasn't known. And then what is it doing in, in the, the actual lung injury model? So what we can do is we, they, they basically have these lung injury models where they use uh, acid, they, they put the mice out. But you can see after three days, you have an increase in this ELAB-like one. Seven days, not so much. So it's an early response, number one. And they also do this 
this lung injury model where they, they uh, put too much pressure in the lung. So you can see that the, the expression goes way up. But if you look at GSK3B here, again, the thing that we know is we think is connected, the pattern looks almost identical in the same model. Again, further validation that this thing is acting together. And they did, right? So they did that. Now they have a model. That acute lung injury somehow induces this ELAB like one, which stabilized GSKB3B, which somehow inhibits epithelial protein clearance. And it's detrimental to the human or organism that they're looking at. Again, this is all free stuff. Man, I'm on time. It's straight. <laughs> And that's it. I want you, if you get anything out of this talk, you know, not the STDs, not the <laughs> not Aquaman. What I, want to, what I want to get across to you is that things are definitely not what they appear. And that when you see a textbook and when somebody hands you this very simple electric circuit board looking thing that, you know, they say is a pathway, it's probably not accurate. And if it is accurate, it's probably only partially accurate that the more data sets that I look at, you know, gene expression is, to me, is, it's almost become a language now. You know, it's like the cells are talking, and they talk different based on the different cell types, the different organisms, and that if you try to compartmentalize these, you kind of have to see the whole story in order to figure out which character is important. That if you only read the first page of the book and you you know the first character on the book is somebody and you go ah oh, that's who I'm going after you know if you don't read it long enough you know maybe the third chapter that character dies right that's kind of what happens in gene expression is that if you don't know the entire story of your signaling or at least a big portion of it you're going to pick the wrong person to to, to basically if you want to manipulate the system um, Any questions? <laughs> yes? So you looked at a metabolic pathway, or one that's very intrinsic with it, which is GSK. And GSK has been found to have extreme mitochondrial circular DNA regulation. So I'm curious if, in the field, has anyone started actually looking at the mitochondria that we know? The mitochondria? Well, we, we you mean the transcribed genes from the, the genome, or are you just talking like the, the actual sequence, or the? Like the, the mitochondria. Right. Yeah, right. So and all those gene chips measure that. So yeah. yes. Okay, cool. So second question would be, what are your considerations when you look at the cancer cell line going into an acute lung injury? Like, do you have a way to either score or, because I imagine a cancer cell, a, a lung that's really connected with cancer, a lung cancer cell line would act much different than a, you know, non-cancer. Cancer, cell. right. You're kind of stuck with what the databases right. you have. Right, and sometimes I like using the, the cancer data sets with disease. I mean, that's the problem is you get these, these pathways, right? And they say, this is the pathway, but that's only when everything's working correctly. If you're looking at a disease, something's always messed up. And that's what I find, especially in cancer, is this gene will be known to induce this gene, and it will be going down. So like, there's something broken there, right? <laughs> so I have to figure that out. Um, I think, you know, if, if you were gonna, I would probably prefer to use like primary cells, maybe, if I was going to do that. But as far as diseases go, especially really nasty diseases like acute lung injuries, you know, there's just stress response stuff going all over the place. So, you know, in those instances, I, you know, I'm okay using the, the lung cancer cell lines. But again, if I was looking at pancreatic cancer or something like that, I'd want to get pancreatic cell lines, right? Or if I was looking at bladder cancer, I'd want, you know, bladder cells, you know? That's what I've noticed is every cell type's a little different. And they, they, again, they all talk a little different. And in order to figure out the language, you have to immerse yourself in that community. <laughs> and so that's kind of like getting all the cell lines, just get them like, how do you guys talk? You know, like, oh, okay. And then they, now you can look at your system. Oh, by the way, I should, I just want to do some acknowledgements before I take another question. Uh, the lung neoplasia stuff, uh, I used to work at the uh, UC Denver Lung Spore. Dan Merrick did the most of that. Uh, GSK3B correlations, uh, again, Christine Vowinkle. Uh, Juke correlations, that Mary Beth uh, Seschler did most of the, the experimental work. She was working with Robert Wynn. 
And I really want to show this. Um, this is my contact information. Um, here's my website. Don't go to the website. I've been working on it for like four months. <laughs> Building websites sucks. <laughs> it's just not fun. Um, I am on YouTube. So my daughter also has her own YouTube page. And um, she's 14, and she's kicking my page channel's ass. So <laughs> please, please visit my YouTube channel many times. I'm also on Facebook. And believe it or not, I teach this to high school kids. I swear. You can go to, I have Google Plus pages. I do a whole year where I teach high school seniors data analytics and bioinformatics. And we did, we did breast cancer. We did lung cancer. It was cool. And they get it. I think that's really what I want to you know, get across to you today is this something you can do that I don't program at all, nor do I want to. I don't code. I mean, I'd rather watch me try to tell you. <laughs> you shouldn't have to program. You shouldn't have to code in order to do this stuff. And there's a lot of platforms out there. You saw, I mean, it was just basic, simple statistics that I did and doing Venn diagrams. You don't need complicated stuff. A lot of this software is, you guys are really going to get it. And you're going to get it a lot more than your 60-year-old PI that you're working under, I tell you. I love talking to you guys more than a room full of, of old scientists because they just look at me like I'm talking voodoo, I swear. Uh, but again, I'm on Google Plus and I'm even on Spotify. Um, as I tell my um, high school students, some of the lyrics are adult, but all the beats are legit. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how do you know like how much data is enough to take like, you always just take everything that's available? Is there, is there a point, like, when lack of efficiency kind of outweighs any increase in accuracy you're going to get? Yes, I'm sure there is. Okay. Um, like, if I took, maybe say I had, like, 10 different lung cancer studies and I did that correlations, I'd probably only get a list of, like, maybe 10 or something. You know, it's resolution versus, you know, big picture. It's, it's tough. And it's, what happens is as you do this stuff, you just kind of get a feel. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a sweet spot for your gene list. Like if you get too many genes, then you won't find any significance in it because you're, you just got too many genes in it. And if it's too small, you won't find any because you just don't have enough to choose from. So about like, you know, my magic area for like gene lists are about, you know, maybe 200 to 300 to maybe 1,200. My rule of thumb is I would never look at a gene list that was more than maybe 5 to 10% of my total genes that I was looking at. So that's a good rule of thumb. So anything under than that. Again, you, there's not just one level to this analysis, right? You know, there's not just one p-value. And so that's what I usually do is I make lots and lots of lists. So I'll make one that's really specific. You know, I'll do false discovery rates up the butt and, you know, it'll be like 25 genes. And then I'll just get really loosey-goosey with the statistics and I'll have one that's like 1,200. Basically, I can look at both those lists and there'll be commonality between those. Like, I get the really in-depth, like, here are my key players, but this is what they're doing kind of stuff. Never have, if somebody tells you, like, you only get one gene list, you know, tell them to go to hell. <laughs> you get lots and lots. That's what I hate. Like, some of this software will charge you by the amount of gene lists that you put in, and I'm just like, I can't do that. <laughs> like, one study, I'll have, like, you know, 10 different gene lists. So, it's all about perspective. And what I'd like to also get across is that I, I tell the story all the time. I'm going to tell it again. You know, it's true that Big Blue, uh, the IBM supercomputer, you know, if, if they put that computer against the world's greatest chess player, the computer wins, right? Everybody's heard of that. What they don't tell you is that that computer player, like, or computer player, chess player gets a computer, then it can beat the original machine. They'll beat Big Blue, right? It's not the human and the machine, which one's better, right? It's if you put both of them together, they're both better than each one separately. There always has to be somebody on these algorithms. You can't just put your gene list in a program and expect to get an answer because it's not an answer. It's a story. Again, the answer to cancer isn't six. <laughs> you know, it isn't a gene. It's a story and you have to... There's chapters, and you just kind of have to go through and, based on your own biological information, you know, knowledge, figure out what the best, what's the best course.
Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.